Now before I get into my standard ramblings, your mother and I need to clear a few things up around here. Most importantly, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa was not named after Kaiser Wilhelm II. Although he was a narcissist, the ship is actually named after Kaiser Wilhelm I, the grandfather of Willy II and the overseer of the unification of Germany with a little help here and there from Bismarck. Okay, with that out of the way, let's begin. Cunard and White Star have always been your textbook transatlantic shipping lines, everybody knows that. So hearing about other contenders in this intangible economic race like France, Germany, and Italy is a rare occurrence. From the early 1900s up to World War I, Germany shined on this route. Don't ask what they did next. Their leading line being the North German Lloyd Line, which sort of still exists today. They also had the Hamburg America Line, but whatever. While the English lines were more for immigrants from the Isles and Americans returning home, the Lloyd Line was pretty working class immigrant centric, ferrying huge amounts of Germans, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and many other Central Europeans to the United States. Today, German makes up the single largest ethnicity in America, and Lloyd Line may have had something to do with it. Lloyd Line's notoriety, however, didn't hit it big until 1897, when Volkenstaden dropped the hottest new vessel. It was the talk of the times, it's not like anything else big was going on in 1897. With Britannia ruling the waves and France doing their best, Germany felt a bit left out. German nationalism was at an all-time high with their recent awesome win over France, and with Prussia leading a sick new German state, those oompa-loving, spike-hat-wearing, Nobel-prizing dudes were making colonies, kicking butts, and taking names. Their new, completely non-controversial Kaiser, Wilhelm II, was hella nationalistic and wanted the new empire to beat everyone at their own game, and for Britain, that was ships. The Kaiser didn't have too much focus on the navy until the 1899 Spithead Naval Review, but to say he wanted more strength for his country in the 1890s wouldn't be a lie. The aforementioned Lloyd Line maybe had a solution, a brand new vessel that wasn't just any smelly old ocean liner. This would be a super liner, a four-funneled monster hellbent on dominating the Atlantic. With such aspirations, her keel was laid down in Stettin in 1896, and she was launched in May of the following year with the Imperial Hohenzollern family in attendance. The Emperor himself proudly christened the ship. From there, the enormous liner was taken to Bremerhaven for completion. Along with that came a lot of other long and complex German words I won't try to pronounce. If you've seen my MV Liemba video, you'll know why. Upon completion, she was 14,349 gross registered tons, longer than but somehow still not larger than the 18,915 gross registered tonned Great Eastern, once again the laughing stock of the nautical community. But it's not worth beating a dead horse. Anyway, back to the, uh, Kaiser class, right. So the ship was dubbed SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, and stood as a symbol of luxury for those who could afford it, and decent to mediocre standards for working class immigrants. She was 660 feet long of German glory. My OCD fans in the audience probably noticed her funnels are unevenly spaced in the middle. The reasoning behind that that she really didn't need four funnels for her 14 boilers. She only had two lower uptake shafts, meaning they branched out so that two funnels would accommodate each shaft. She was revolutionary in other ways than just her funnels though. I'd hope so because that's far more boring for a video. Another major innovation could be found in her lower hull. At the time of the late 1890s, vibrations were a huge problem for steamships, and they would only get worse through the time of the Lusitania. Olympic, Vaterland, and all the way into the 1920s. North German Lloyd's solution came from a man named Otto Schlick, who used a method dubbed the Schlick system to keep the boilers from being stiffly connected to the hull and to keep them stable with gravity. This way, it would negate vibration. It worked decently, but wasn't terribly practical. I think the system involved gyroscopes, but I couldn't find a source that went that far in depth. Sorry, I know you were just burning with curiosity on that tale. Anywho, the ship was the talk of the town during her maiden voyage, going around 20 knots. Pretty impressive if I do say so myself, and... I do. She was decently stable, luxurious, and featured some pretty intricate design work on her interior. Her first class suites were very luxurious for their wealthier passengers, and had parlors and baths exclusively for their suites. Weirdly, the first ship to offer such accommodations. Notice how I don't mention steerage accommodations. Not great, all I'm gonna say. In early 1898, she stole the eastbound and soon the westbound crossing record, and with it the blue ribbon. An intangible prize meaning you were the fastest ship on the transatlantic route. It was a big deal back before people had things to care about, like esports. Technically, it wasn't called the blue ribbon widely until 1910, but I'm almost certain you've already lost interest. The ship was easily the pride of her nation. That was until Hamburg America Line dropped their new liner, SS Deutschland, which stole the blue ribbon from her in 1900 and then westbound in 1903. 
Interestingly, the SS Deutschland was built in Stedden too, meaning they funded both sides of the fight. The ship also looks remarkably similar to the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, but that's probably a testament to trends of the time. Back then, people actually put effort into design. Not like today, Google. You corporate gremlins. No way. The German people didn't really care that the Deutschland was the fastest ship. It was still a German ship after all, and honestly, they probably didn't care that much anyway. I know you probably don't, but you know who did care? North German Lloyd. Although it wasn't entirely done for the Blue Ribbon, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse was taken in for a refit to tune her up a bit to match the competition. She also had wireless communication tech installed in this refit too, the first Atlantic Ocean liner to boast that, also increasing public trust in her safety. She didn't steal back the Blue Ribbon if you're curious, kind of a letdown. The Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse was seen as safe, speedy, and reliable, especially in 1900, when a fire broke out at her quay while she was docked in Hoboken, New Jersey, killing 161 dock staff and catching on a few ships docked near her. She moved up the Hudson and miraculously escaped before she could fall victim to the flames. I think the saddest part of that story is that she was in New Jersey, a fate worse than death. She went six easy years without incident, raking in the big bucks for Lloyd Line. Despite this luck, in November, the RMS Orinoco slammed into her, puncturing a 26-foot-long tear in her hull and prompting eight deaths. Because the superliner had pulled in front of the Orinoco, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse was declared to be entirely at fault for the incident by the Admiralty and had to pay for damages. She was repaired, but it was a black mark on her record. Fortunately, she would continue her career with an unbroken reputation for safety and class, not once serving another collision, and her reputation was well-maintained. To the public, she was reliable and good to all passengers, minus the losers in steerage. She held this recognition well and held it for countless voyages full of satisfied travelers. That was until 1910 when the mayor of New York was shot in the neck while disembarking on a vacation to Europe on board. The ship hadn't even left port yet, still docked in Hoboken. A photographer disturbingly caught the event, showing the bloodied mayor as he struggled for his life. What's really weird is that the bullet remained in his neck for the rest of his life, which wasn't that much longer anyway. For three years, he slowly lost his ability to speak, yet remained a politician, the bullet eventually killing him in 1913. He died in a deck chair on board the RMS Baltic. What? So there's something to talk about at parties. SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse's remaining career with North German Lloyd was uneventful until 1914, when this happened. She was requisitioned by the Imperial government to function as an auxiliary cruiser, fixed with some guns, and was then assigned a commerce rating by the Canary Islands off the coast of North Africa. Yes, the same islands the SS America would wreck on nearly 80 years later. Consider it foreshadowing. Now I know while Germany's reputation in the war was a bit... unpleasant, the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse actually adhered strictly to the rules of war, unlike her undersea counterparts. The vessel spared two passenger ships after learning they had women on board, and only ever sank two freighters. In late August, she was being bunkered in Rio de Oro when she spotted the HMS High Flyer in the distance. The Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse offboarded all POWs and immediately steamed toward her target with deadly intentions. A fierce battle took place between the vessels, but unfortunately, SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse ran out of ammo. Now here's where things get a bit messy. The British still, to this day, declare that the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse sank from being wounded by the High Flyer, but the Germans insist that the captain ordered her to be scuttled with dynamite, which was already in place ahead of time. All we know is that she capsized post-detonation, and the captain survived the sinking to still hold true to the scuttling story. So the most likely tale is that the captain was telling the truth while the Brits got it wrong, but it's impossible to tell. Why? Because for whatever reason, they scrapped her right after discovering her wreck in the 1950s. Seems wrong. So beyond the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, very little is mentioned about the Kaiser class of ships. Probably because they were all nearly identical. But that matters not to me. The big four were all almost identical, and I made a crappy video about that too, so why not? We'll see what the future carries. I appreciate all the support I'm getting for these videos. My subscriber count sort of exploded after I posted my SS America one, so much appreciated. So what did we learn today? Don't trust the British and don't go to New Jersey. That's all I got for you.